One of the modern day saints of the church is a fellow by the name of Desmond Tutu. He is the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of South Africa and his story, one of the most important parts of his life, of his story, is leading what we now call the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is a the story that tell, he tells in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness. And it tells of this time of transition in the life of the nation of South Africa as a transition out of apartheid. Apartheid, I don't know how well known it is the details of this, but apartheid was this, this way of governance in South Africa that arose in the mid-1950s. And what it was was a, a way for the uh, people would come to South Africa, the Dutch settlers, to oppress and subjugate those who were the natives of the land. And they were subjugating the vast majority of the people there. So it was a white minority subjugating a vast black uh, majority of people. And it has become sort of this, this term, apartheid has become this term that is, it's kind of second only to being called a Nazi, right? If you want to call someone the worst of the worst, you call them a Nazi. If you want to back it off a Nazi, you start comparing them to apartheid South Africa. It got really, really bad. And so uh, after th uh, 40 years of this, 50 years of this or so, it was in the early 90s that apartheid ceases. It, it, it stops. And uh, they have to figure out what's going to happen next. This is the point at which the world celebrates as Nelson Mandela is released, as he is elected president in the first free and fair elections in, in decades. But they have to figure out what is going to happen with their history because they have blood on their hands. Those who have resisted apartheid had sinned against those who supported it. Those who had supported apartheid had sinned against those who, who were oppressed by it. And there were those who had stood by while others had suffered. And, and the nation as a whole had this, this ugly, ugly past, this ugly history. Um, and there were events that you just were never going to be able to forget. For example, one of the things that happened on a regular basis was that if you were accused of supporting the apartheid government, what sometimes would happen to you is they'd put a necklace on you. And what that was was a car tire around your neck and filled with gasoline then lit on fire. And that was a way to, to kill government sympathizers. It was just horrific. And so the nation had to figure out what to do with its past. And it had two options, two, two options that we have seen in the last century of how nations have dealt with their past. Well, one option is what we saw with uh, the Nuremberg trials. After World War II, we have this moment when Germany has to deal with its past. And what was done to Germany, because it was a loser, the victors decided that the losers would go on trial, and we have the Nuremberg trials. And that worked at that point, to what degree it worked, is a, probably another discussion, another day. But the central fact of the Nuremberg trials is the victors put the losers on, on trial. And that was one way to deal with the past. But that wouldn't work in South Africa. Because World War II ended with a winner and a loser. Whereas apartheid fell because two sides agreed to stop fighting. And when they agreed to stop fighting, it's not that they lost the ability to fight. Like Germany had lost the ability to fight. They had, they had decided to try something else. But if they had found out that a Nuremberg trial approach was about to happen, well, they could just pick up their guns again because it would have been better to fight than to be sent to jail. And so that sort of winner-loser approach to dealing with history, that wasn't going to work in South Africa. And so maybe there was another approach that we have seen in the last century. The, the approach that we see in Ireland after the time of what, what do we, the great euphemism called the Troubles. After decades of the Troubles, this time period in Ireland when uh, Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants killed each other over control of government, uh, after, at the end of this, there was the Good Friday Accord, the Good Friday Agreement. It was in 1998 that this happened. And it was a way to, to put a government together and, and to stop fighting each other. And, and it happened, 1998, the end of the Troubles. 
except they didn't deal with their past. They didn't deal with their past. They, they, instead of having a winner and a loser, they just ignored that the past had happened at all. And so if you follow European politics at, at all, you'll probably have heard recently that Jerry Adams, one of the leaders in Irish politics, the, a former leader, or current leader, I guess, of Sinn Féin, one of the, the political groups that going all the way back into the times of the Troubles, has uh, just been uh, released after an extended arrest based upon a murder that happened 42 years ago. 42 years ago. Think about that. Can you imagine trying to run a political situation, run a government, when something from 42 years ago can come up right now and sabotage what you're trying to do right now? And that's not the, the exception for Irish politics. That's, that's something that happens on a regular basis because what, right before this Jerry Adams uh, situation developed, there was another situation where the, one party of the government had pardoned some of the, the people who had supported them during the troubles. The, some of the people had been either terrorists or freedom fighters, depending upon your point of view. Uh, and the other party had gotten all uptight about how you know they were offered amnesty and they shouldn't have been offered amnesty. And it's the same type of thing. Thing. It was amnesty for crimes committed long ago, and, and so the past keeps on coming up and, and causing troubles for Ireland in it, its present and future. And South Africa didn't want to do that. I mean, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to pretend the past had never happened, because if you don't acknowledge the past and deal with it, then, then it's just going to keep on coming up to cause you problems. I hope that you can feel how that's kind of how we start dealing with uh, conflict and forgiveness and challenges in our lives because those are two approaches that we tend to use, right? We look for a winner and a loser. I'm right, you're wrong, and that's that. The Nuremberg approach. Or, or we just pretend nothing ever happened and we pretend nothing ever happened until it can be 30, 42 years later and someone walks in the room and says something that, and all of a sudden you're right back to that problem that happened so long ago that never got dealt with. And so South Africa is facing this challenge. They can't do the win or loser approach. Can't ignore the past. So what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They found a third way, is what they did. They found a third way called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was a venue, a traveling venue that went around the nation gathering up all that had happened during the horrible years of apartheid, gathering up all that had happened, giving the victims a, a venue in which they could say their piece, tell their story, be respected for the events that had happened to them and not be ignored and tell, told that it was anything less than, than a tragedy that, that people had been hurt and murdered and killed like this. And, and after telling their piece and telling their story, reparations were made. And yes, the reparations were we're not full reparations, for you can never pay to replace uh, someone who has died. But they were symbolic and they were meaningful. If you didn't know where a loved one had, was died and buried, they, you, you could find out. And then the government would pay to put a tombstone there to honor the person who had died. Someone whose child had not been able to go to school because their father was not there to support them. Maybe you pay for the, the college for that, that child. And so these, these reparations were made for the victims who told their story. But also the, the people who had uh, committed the crimes could also come forward to this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and they were able to say their piece. This is what I did in support of apartheid. This is what I, this is what I did to, to try to sabotage apartheid, to resist it. And these are the ways I went over the line and committed crimes and sins against my, my neighbors, my countrymen. And when the, when the people who had done this came forward, they were able to receive amnesty. They were able to receive amnesty once they had told the whole truth about uh, what they had done. Now, what this Truth and, Recon Re Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, Commission faced were the same problems that we face when it comes to forgiveness today. They faced the challenges such as... Do, we, do they need to require someone's apology or confession to be sincere enough? That's the same thing we run into today when we start talking about confession and apology, right? There is no way that a person's confession or apology 
can make it feel better because there's no apology that when you're bleeding and you're hurt by another person there's no apology that can stop the bleeding it's just acknowledging I'm, I'm sorry for, for having hurt you for having cut you and so they they realized that they could not judge the sincerity or, or the effusiveness of a person's apology that they would they would settle for the just say what you had done confess it and, and don't claim innocence and that's what they could ask because there were no words that would make people feel right and better again. They, they had to grapple with things like, is forgiving someone condoning what they did? And they, they settled on saying, no, I forgive the person, but I, that does not mean I condone the deed that they did. And finally, they had to, they had to face this challenge that we have faced so many times, the, the challenge of can people change? If, if so-and-so had done this horrific act, do we even attempt to talk with them and talk to them? Can they change? Can they? Can, and how often have we, we heard that type of argument, that type of logic in our own families and in churches and communities? You know, that's just so-and-so. They're not going to change. That's just so-and-so. We just got to deal with them, just put up with them, just get used to it. And what they came to is the conclusion is, that lets people off the hook way too easily. When we say that that's just so and so they can't change, whether it's a, because they've done horrible acts or because they have been callous in a certain way time and time and time again, what we're doing is letting them off the hook and saying that they are something less than children of God called to follow Jesus Christ and be transformed into better people into more holy people. And to say that people cannot change is to ignore that God calls each and every one of us to live a more holy life day by day. And so they, they grappled with these topics that forgiving is not condoning, that, that there is no apology that will ever feel sincere enough, that, that saying that's just so and so they'll never change is to let them off the hook. But, and they, they grappled with these things and what they did over a course of years and going around the nation is by finding a way, this third way, to grapple with their past, they laid the groundwork for a future that is not both, that isn't sabotaged by its past, that doesn't have winners and losers so that you just switch places who is persecuting who, but actually set the groundwork for a nation that still is running and still functioning. And if you follow South African politics, you may know that the ANC, the African National Congress, no Nelson Mandela's party, it has struggled to find people of Nelson Mandela's caliber to, to follow him. And the nation does continue to struggle in some ways, but they don't have to struggle with this. For if they did have to struggle with this, I don't know if the nation would have survived. But because they found this third way to forgive, to reconcile, to work with each other, they set the groundwork for a future together. Now, what is striking about this story, what is just absolutely breathtakingly obvious about this story, is uh, that it's the story of a nation, right? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is the story of a nation learning to forgive, learning to confess, learning to reconcile and rebuild with itself. And what a nation is, at its most fundamental, is a bunch of people gathered together in the same place. A bunch, that, that's what it is. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission created this process for all these people gathered together in the same place to learn and practice forgiveness. And we, at our fundamental reality, what we are is a bunch of people gathered in the same place. I'm not saying we're a nation, but that's what a church is. We are a bunch of people gathered in the same place on a regular basis, and we, we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, the question I find myself wondering as I, I read this story of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is I found myself wondering, can we do the same? Can we become the place that people learn the art of forgiveness, practice the art of forgiveness, become talented and experienced in the art of forgiveness? 
For if we read the scriptures closely, this is the type of life that we read of, right? If we read of Paul, what Paul tells, it's the church at Colossae, he gives this, this instruction. He tells them, it's Colossians 3, 12 and following, as those who have been chosen by God, uh, be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. And when you mess that all up, because you will, forgive each other. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. This is, this is very honest of Paul, and I appreciate that. Be square with each other, but when you're not, forgive. That's how we're to live as people who follow Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciples, he tells them that there is power in our forgiveness. That it is a powerful and beautiful thing. It's in uh, John, the Gospel of John 20, 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. Jesus gives his disciples this power, this authority. When you forgive people, they're forgiven. Those sins go away. They are poof. And this is a beautiful and powerful thing to be able to forgive sin. After contemplating the centrality of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how it facilitated the practice of forgiveness, after spending so many years reading through scripture and, and just soaking in the themes of what, what, what makes the God we worship, you, what, what, what makes that God, what, what's part of that God's personality that we are called to follow and, and emulate. I, I'm seeing more and more that the practice of forgiveness is at the core of what it means to follow Jesus. That if Christianity is not about forgiveness, then it's not about anything really. Because the core moments of the Christian faith are moments like when Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then when we accept that we are forgiven of our sins, and we accept that we are forgiven, it is the most important moment for Jesus on the cross. It's one of the most important moments in our lives is when we accept that we are forgiven. And so if Christianity isn't about forgiveness, well then what is it about? And, and Brian Zahn, the pastor up in northwest Missouri, helped crystallize this, this for me. But he pointed this out, and I've become convinced of this. I was reading something by Brian Zahn, it must be nine months ago, and he helped me see this centrality of forgiveness. And that the church is thus called to be a place where we practice forgiveness, where we become experienced at forgiveness. And so today, and over the next two weeks, I want to give ourselves a framework, not just to talk about forgiveness in the abstract. I mean, it feels great to talk about forgiveness in the abstract. Just, just forgive people. It's, it's easy to say. But forgiveness is rooted in, in being hurt. That one person has hurt another, or two people have hurt each other. And, and to handle such challenges requires uh, some practices, uh, some things that we can get used to doing now when we're not hurting, so that we can then do that later when, when we are. And so these next, uh, to the, this week and then the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how do you practice forgiveness? What do you do to forgive someone? And to help us get our minds around how this works, what it looks like, I'm going to borrow something. It is Adam Hamilton at Church of the Resurrection. This is something he uses to show people sin. What, how does sin work? This is what he does. He, Adam puts on a backpack. And he ta explains, you know, when, when someone sins, it's like they're handing you a rock. And so if... If I uh, go out and, and I move your purse, and I, and I move your purse without telling you, you'd be rightfully offended. Little sin, little rock. But let's say that I, I dig into your purse and borrow five dollars without asking. That's a little bit bigger. Bigger sin, bigger rock. I'm handing you this, this sin. This weight. Well, let's say that it's more than just borrowing, borrowing five dollars. Maybe I go through and I grab myself a credit card and order something off Amazon. And you start getting these bills for, uh, for new computers. That, that's fairly significant, sin. And there's a really big rock down here. I'm not going to pick it up because 
it hurts. But uh, that would be the equivalent of uh, identity theft, right? And so when when someone sins against you, when someone sins against you, it's like they're handing you a rock. And if you hold on to all of them, if you hold on to them, it's in your backpack. It starts to get a little bit heavy, doesn't it? This backpack actually is just a little bit uncomfortably heavy. And we got to figure out what to do with those stones. What if, uh, what if we hold on to those? We're going to focus today on the small stones, those small things. But uh, what happens if every time someone, I, I get up in the morning and, and someone offends me and someone does wrong by me, I go out for breakfast and they, they give me decaf instead of caffeinated cough, coffee and that, that, that's wrong. You don't do that to me. That, right? or, or what if then I'm driving to work and uh, someone cuts me off? That, that's another stone. And then I get to work and no one's returning my phone calls or my emails. No one's uh, putting more paper in the uh, copy machine. I mean, you can see how this goes. You go out to, you go out to lunch and your waitress is really slow. And then you drive home and, and, and your spouse doesn't have dinner ready. I mean, you, you see how this happens when people sin against you or do these little things against you. Every time they do that, they're handing you a small rock again and again and again. And if you, if you hold on to these rocks, what happens? Can you imagine what it's like every day to be given all these rocks? And if you hold on to that hurt, you hold on to that anger, you hold on to that stone... What, what happens? Well, this backpack starts to get real heavy, doesn't it? And unless we start to learn how to do something, like letting go. So when someone gives me the wrong coffee, I, I, I'm able to take that and say, you know, that, that's, that's okay. I'm, I'm not going to get angry about that. Or when, when my, my, my lunch comes out and it, it, the french fries aren't hot, I, I don't hold on to that stone. I don't hold on to that offense, that sin. I, I, I can put it down and I can move on without being weighed down by what's just happened to me. But, but how do you do that? How do you handle it when someone cuts you off in traffic and you're running late and then starts to go five miles per hour slower than the speed limit and you're just, just angry at someone? How do you handle that? We're going to talk about that today and then next week we'll talk about how to handle the medium-sized stones, the, the bigger offenses, and then two weeks from now we'll talk about how to handle those really big stones, the big problems. We'll, we'll talk about the, the things like when someone lies to you next week and the week after that we'll, go, we'll deal with things like adultery. But this week, how do you deal with the small things? How do you let go of those small stones? Well, Adam Hamilton has some advice, and I think it's about the best advice I've heard to, to articulate what it feels like to let go of these small stones. And it goes something like this. He has this acronym. Remember, assume, pray. Rap. Yes, R-A-P. Remember, assume, and pray. And it goes like this. When someone sins against you, and it's a small thing, the stewardess on the airline flight doesn't is less than chipper, less than perky. Someone at the gas station is not exactly pleased to see you when you try to move in a hurry and get out of there. Uh, pay for your gas and get moving, things like this. The first thing we do is remember that we're not always perfect either. Inasmuch as no, people are not perfect to me, there are plenty of times when I am less than graceful than others. There are plenty of times when I have kept someone off. There are plenty of times when I have not listened as well as I should have. There are plenty of times when I've been in a rush and not slowed down. And there are plenty of times I have done these small things to others. And so the first step to letting go of these rocks is to remember that we're handing those out too. Remember, we're less than perfect. And so first we remember. We remember that we are less than perfect. That's remember. The second thing is assume. We assume the best about the person, what, what's happening. We assume that the person who's being short with us is being short because they were up late with a sick child, right? Or we assume that the person who, is being, who, who has uh, cut us off in traffic is on the way to the hospital or something. We, we assume the best about the person. And this might be one of the more challenging parts of this because when someone walks in the door that we're used to being annoyed at who has given us many of these small rocks, 
we, we, and they, they don't talk to us. Let's say someone walks in the door that we don't usually get along with and they don't talk to us. We can assume that they're, they're, they're ignoring us. They, we can assume that they're trying to ignore us, trying to get under our skin. Or we can assume the best about them. And we can assume that they just didn't see us. And when we assume the best about people, that, that this lowers the tension, right? We remember that we're not perfect, that we've ignored people too, and then we assume the best about people. And finally, remember, assume, and the last thing Adam Hamilton recommends when dealing with these small sins is pray. Jesus says, pray for your enemies. And I don't think that's just the big enemies in life. I, we, most of us don't have big enemies. What we have are, are people who are handing us these small rocks all the time. And uh, pray for them. Remember that we're not perfect. Assume the best and, and start praying for that person. Right there when it happens, the person who just doesn't do right by us, right then you just stop and, and pray. God, just fill their life with peace because we know that they can do better than this. Just God, just be with them right now and, and help me love this person. Pray for that person. Remember that we're not perfect. Assume the best and pray for that person. If we can start doing all of this... Or this, this practice, that will be the way we start letting go of these small rocks. And day by day, we won't be burdening ourselves by stashing up all these small offenses and making ourselves heavy with the weight and the anger of all these problems that happen. As I said back at Easter, we as Christians have two ways of handling when we're sinned against. We forgive and let go, or we forgive and rebuild. And this is what the forgive and let go. We let go of the small rocks, we just let go of them. Remember that we're not perfect, we assume the best about people, we pray about, pray for them, and then we just let it go, and we move on without being burdened by it. Today I want to invite you to make a commitment to do this. Or a recommitment, if this is something you've thought of before. I want to invite you to make a commitment to letting go of all the small offenses, all the small sins, all the small things. I invite you to, to follow this acronym, RAP. Remember, assume, pray, and be begin this as a way of life. Next week, uh, we will get into the big things, but bigger things, but this is the smaller stuff. This is the, 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 the smaller stuff that constitute a way of life of forgiveness. This is how we practice forgiveness. Jesus says that when asked how many times should we forgive, the answer he gives is 70 times 7. Forgive so many times that you lose track. Forgive so many times that it becomes a way of life. Forgive again and again and again so that you are not when someone hands, hands you a small stone because they've got crossways with you over a small thing that you just put that down and move on. Forgive as a way of life. Next week we'll figure out what to do with the big sins but this week we start our practice of forgiveness by letting go of the small stuff. Just, just let it go. Remember, assume, pray, and let it go. Amen.